Good morning, good afternoon to everyone and welcome to our session today. Uh, we are going to talk about autonomous database. This event uh, is part of a series of events related to autonomous database service uh, that you guys are going to see within the cloud coaching program uh, aimed, of course, to help our developers accelerating their productivity with Oracle Autonomous Database. Uh, speaking about who we are, I am Violeta. I'm a digital adoption manager for live events in EMEA. Today, I'm joined by Herman, who is the director for community management in Oracle Autonomous Database. Uh, and he will be your presenter for this session. Keep in mind that we have prepared uh, also a demo um, um, an autonomous database provisioning demo, um, actually, that uh, Herman will will show you. Um, so, uh, in case you guys have an Oracle account created, we encourage you to log in, and why not taking this journey together with us? All right, uh, that was all on my side. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Herman now, and uh, of course, Violet, Violet yeah. before we start the thumbs up idea on. Um on who's heard of autonomous. We just want to get a quick, yeah. quick survey on that. <laughs> Thank, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. No so we'll give us your thumbs up if you are familiar with Oracle Autonomous Database. In this way, we know how many of you have heard about it. All right. That's good. I That's see. Good. I see that tons of you are familiar with it. Thanks a lot for, for your reactions. Yeah. All right. Good. Let's kick it off then. Enjoy the and enjoy the session. Okay, Don't forget perfect. the Slack to, to ask your questions. And of course, the Q&A in the chat. All right, cool. So I'll start sharing my screen then. Please. Thank you, Violeta. You're welcome. So, OK, so hello. My name is Armand Biscuso. I'm the director of the developer community around Autonomous Database. And most of my, my time, I'm focusing on building a healthy developer community around Autonomous or ADB as we call it for short. So every time I'm going to say, I say autonomous or ADB, I'm talking about autonomous database, okay? I will cover, uh, cover it in this presentation. For those of you who are curious before joining Oracle, I was a senior developer advocate and architect at Amazon. And I've been on this line of work for more than 15 years now. So I, can, I hope I can bring some of that, that expertise to you, okay? So let's get started then. Okay. So first of all, let's discuss the dynamics of the presentation and take a quick look at the, at the agenda, okay? So you know what's coming and you don't feel lost during the presentation. So I will be using a few slides to give you background and prepare you for a demo, which more or less comes in the middle of the webinar, okay? The, this demo will help, be, uh, help us get up and running with ADB. Uh, and uh, after the demo, I will quickly cover a few topics of interest for developers uh, and I'll give you a chance to vote on which ones you would like me to cover uh, deeply in my next sessions. Uh, I said, uh, uh, I say sessions because this is the first webinar of the series. So uh, it's on purpose a little bit more high level, more introductory to put it some way. Uh, but uh, I want to intro also introduce the main developer facing uh, topics uh, and make a few points on the benefits of autonomous and go deeper on each one as we continue with, with the series. So we will have a chance to basically shape the series uh, as, we, as we move forward. Uh, in any case, as I said, we are going to get our hands dirty in the middle. And I, I invite you to follow me today uh, if you created an OC account. And hopefully, you will have this great promo that Violeta mentioned to actually go ahead and create a free trial account and get $500 for free, so you will have plenty of uh, credits to basically create autonomous databases, etc. And if you want to follow me while I go through the console, you can you can do that and try to browse around and becoming uh, start to become familiar with the with autonomous in OCI. Okay, so with OCI, I refer to Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, of course. Uh, okay, so uh, let's move on. And let's take a start with uh, uh, application architectures, just a very high level overview. It's this very simplified, uh, but uh, let's take a look at how we've been building applications in the past 20 years uh, or so. If you've been around for a while like me, you remember that there were data centers with physical servers running uh, what you would call monolithic uh, three tier architectures, typical user interface, business logic and data store. 
So that's the first column that I have there when I say monolithic. Then came data, data centers, which incorporated virtual machines uh, running end-tier architectures in the cloud. So I would say we went into the cloud-based era, but it wasn't, this wasn't really cloud-native yet. Uh, but uh, now in the last 10 years or so, uh, we saw an evolution of the cloud-based approach where cloud has been increasingly used to develop uh, and deploy microservices. And that's what I uh, say, uh, what I signal there when I say MSA, which is microservices architecture. Uh, most of the modern applications that are running today run as microservices on containers, uh, developed using DevOps processes and tools. But also in the last few years, we have seen the rise of the serverless approach. If you're a developer, you probably heard serverless, serverless everywhere, right? Uh, um, where developers don't want to do any operational work as far as the underlying infrastructure is concerned and communication is done via events. That's why I say EDA there, which is event driven architecture. Okay. So one thing we can observe in any of these architectures, and we will focus on the say the uh, columns on the right, the two columns on the right, microservices and, and events, uh, any of these architectures, even the old ones, always have had one thing in common, which is the database. From less uh, to more abstracted as we move forward, but the database was there, okay? But uh, uh, so as we move from a traditional approach to a more modern cloud native app development uh, approach, uh, what are the challenges that we see when we're dealing with the database? And that's what I want to cover today and uh, specifically focusing on this de development architectures. Okay, so uh, I mentioned, so I mentioned microservices and mic the microservices architecture. Most of you should know by now how developers are leveraging microservices in, in modern architectures. Uh, the idea is not new though. If you've been, if I come from software engineering, uh, so there was always this, uh, when we were uh, studying pro programming, etc. there's always this, uh, say, uh, mandate of achieving low coupling uh, when you are building components, etc., and and high cohesion uh, uh, with, with your components, with your maybe classes, you know, objects, etc. So the concept is the same for microservices, but at the service level. Uh, now, imagine that uh, I'm part of an engineering team and I'm in charge of one specific microservice. Uh, because as you know, you can have multiple teams working in different microservices, more isolated. You can have completely different teams working on a specific microservice. So suppose this is the case. Uh, and suppose the, the use case is data-driven. I need to access data from somewhere. Uh, and, I, and I have freedom to basically decide you know, what I'm going to use because it's my microservice. So I probably go choose a database that fits the type of data that the service has to handle, right? There are multiple uh, different data types out there. So we, uh, as soon as we do that, we face the database per service problem, okay? And that's how some of us call it, the database per service problem. So let us say so you have different microservices here with a document DB, a key value DB, a relational DB, a spatial DB, and a graph DB. Here you can see like five variations, right? Suppose they are written in different languages. So this is just five microservices that you're dealing with, but what, what happens when you grow and see yourself running 50 or 100 microservices? What this leads to is complexity in the architecture. You need to have specific skills to manage the databases that are behind each microservice. And you have to understand and have experience with different ways of dealing with data ingestion, uh, data integration, data propagation, um, management of your database, security, etc. A whole different thing uh, that you have to deal with for each one of these, right? So the complexity in the management and deployment of these databases comes with a cost, which is something we cannot overlook, okay? So how can we solve this? Uh, we can do this with a converged database. And if you heard about Oracle and, or and the Oracle database, you probably heard about converged database. But for those of you who are not familiar, what is the concept? What, what do we mean when we say uh, we have a converged database? And I'm talking about converged because this is the basis of autonomous database and we will get there. So Oracle has been adding converged database capabilities within the Oracle database for years now. The core idea behind this is instead of having separate database uh, for each data type, uh, to have a multi-model database which uh, will support 
key value, JSON, graph, spatial, blockchain, relational database in the same database architecture. So you can have the best of all worlds uh, within a single database architecture. So combined with a multi-tenant architecture, which is something I'm going to mention when you have pluggable DBs that run on containers. So similar to what developers are doing with con uh, Kubernetes and containers, we have an architecture for databases specifically that works with containers and pluggable databases, which is very, very interesting. Uh, you can also, uh, thanks to the combination of pluggable database and Converge, uh, make it really easy to do data integration, management, security of your database, and make the underlying uh, architecture for microservices simpler. Because suppose that I have to uh, deal with the security or maybe apply a patch or something like that to these databases, I can do that for all of the different pluggable databases that are there and are supporting different microservices. But I have one view of that that administration. Um, speaking about administration, this is something that uh, will uh, Autonomous Database does for you. So uh, let's uh, take a closer look. Um, before going into Autonomous Database, I just want to give you an understanding of the type of data that we are uh, able to handle right now with a single technology. So we often see this trend where uh, a new data, as new data types emerge in technology space, uh, new solutions pop up uh, with specialized products that handle just a single use case. And I remember that when that happens with document databases, for example, I, I was there, I come from a NoSQL background, and I, I, I was there when, you know, the, the whole hype around document, JSON, et cetera, started. So a lot of the very specific and specialized, specialized products or databases start appearing, right? They are usually very fast, very specific. Everybody embraces it like right away, but uh, we all do it before understanding the consequences. Uh, maybe what happens if uh, it's, it, the, uh, the solution is super difficult to manage, etc. So we don't. Sometimes we don't pay too much attention to small details, right? But a converged database uh, sol solidly incorporates native support for all these data types and can run all types of workloads. Uh, diff different types of workloads from columnar databases to do analytics to transaction processing on OLTP documents with, J with JSON collections inside and it's the same database technology so it it's kind of uh, really cool so uh, let's move uh, let's move on and uh, let me give you just one example, which makes this uh, really cool uh, when you are working with autonomous databases specifically and I'm going to um, uh, give a description on autonomous in a sec, but basically you can uh, have the data that you would typically have in a MongoDB application, JSON, JSON collections, etc. You can put it there and you can even use the uh, MongoDB wire protocol to actually access the, the database. So when you combine uh, native JSON documents and collections uh, supporting autonomous database with protocol compatibility, you can use uh, your existing skills. Like for example, suppose you're a MongoDB developer and you can use your existing skills to actually work with uh, autonomous data database as if it were uh, a document store. Okay. All right. So now autonomous, I've been talking about autonomous database, etc. but I uh, basically cover converged database. So uh, enough of Converge, uh, what is Autonomous Database, okay? Some of you already gave me the thumbs up, so you already know, but just to summarize it for those of you that did not give me the thumbs up, Oracle's Autonomous Database leverages the Oracle Converge Database, which I just uh, briefly described, uh, to obtain a simplified architecture and an operational model. But it has, adds more things to the mix. It also makes the DB self-service and pay-per-use, so it's cloud-native. And by putting it in the cloud, uh, um, it basically makes really easy to provision, et cetera. We'll go uh, see a demo for provisioning and how to work with the database, et cetera. But this is basically 100% in the cloud, but behind, uh, in, in the cloud, in the actual data centers, the hardware that is running this database is called Exadata. And that's something I wanted to ask. Uh, please give me a thumbs up if you heard about Exadata before, so I have an idea. But basically, Exadata is uh, a, a hardware that is tuned to run uh, database workloads, and it's the fastest database tuned uh, hardware in uh, in the market, basically. So uh, I would say that when we spin up hardware for you in the cloud to actually run autonomous database, we're giving you actually the best that you can have for running a database uh, workload. 
uh, so far, okay? So another thing that we add to the mix is machine learning. And that's the third thing that we have there before the equal, right? So why do we add machine learning? Because uh, we don't want you to worry about tuning the database, scaling the database, securing the database, patching the database. This is something that usually you don't care about if you want to focus on building and deploying applications. So you don't have to spend time doing all of that. Everything that we can automate, we automate. So to give you an idea uh, and a very quick analogy, think of like the self-driving car, but taken to the database, okay? All right. So I talk about automatic things that, that uh, uh, autonomous agents can do, can do for you. So the strong focus on automation uh, with these features that you can see here, like auto-toning, auto-scaling, auto-dating, auto-provisioning, auto-encryption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, makes it simple and easier to go to cloud native architect architectures because it allows developers to forget about all the tedious details of database management and focus on delivering data-driven services. Okay, so enough explanations. Let's go to, to the demo now. But first, before going to the demo, let me show you the basic architecture of ADB because you will feel more familiar as I go through the console, et cetera, and show you the different components. You will feel more familiar with what you're going to see in the exercise, okay? So last one before the demo, uh, let me show you uh, this, okay? So first of all, ADB comes in two deployment flavors. One is shared and the other is dedicated. Our, I personally uh, part of the uh, dedicated team. Okay, so with just share, you get one of those cylinders that you can see here in this uh, in this graphic, right? And that's one pluggable database or PDB as we call it. Uh, and and share, we, we call it, uh, some people also call it serverless. So we call it share because it might sit next to other databases that you do not own, okay? So you do not control the VM, you do not control the underlying next data, you control the database. Uh, there are multiple ADBs or ADB means autonomous database, of course, so there are multiple ADBs contained in autonomous container databases or ACDs. So here when you see ACD, which is basically this white boxes, it's a container database to where you can put multiple pluggable databases, okay? But the, why containers? Because it makes it easier to define container level operations, right? Like overall databases. Suppose I want to patch all of them. I just do that at the, at the container level and say, okay, I'm going to patch all of this pluggable databases, okay? All right, so containers live in autonomous VM clusters, which are the gray boxes that we have here, autonomous VM clusters. So think of it, think of it as the VM, you know, which run in a database optimized hardware, uh, which is the exadata infrastructure, which is the whole, the whole thing that we have there. Okay. So I wanted to uh, I wanted you to understand the overall architecture. Share is the easiest, uh, the share deployment for autonomous is the easiest and quickest to provision and has a lot of interesting features. Uh, as, as I will show you in, in a bit, but dedicated, uh, the dedicated deployment option gives you the whole stack just for you uh, so from the extra data infrastructure to individual databases. So it's your private database cloud in the public cloud. Nothing, if, if you provision your own extra data infrastructure, you provision your autonomous VM clusters, you provision your containers, nobody can, uh, nobody sits next to you. So basically that's your infrastructure. Okay, so demo time. I'm going to uh, change the screen that I'm sharing. So let me stop sharing. Okay. Um, okay. So just give me one sec. I'm going to share. desktop two now, share, okay, hopefully you can see it. Okay, I'm going here, cloud at oracle.com. So uh, hopefully you can see, give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen, if you can see a single sign on page. Yep, we're cool. Okay, okay. Good. Per per perfect, perfect. I just want to make sure it would not be the first time that I'm talking about a specific uh, screen and <laughs> I'm showing a different one. Okay, so uh, okay, so we will continue here and we will sign in. Okay, so I have a tenancy here. All right, so this is OCI, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. 
uh, it's a cloud where you can provision multiple things from compute databases, etc. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, it's I'm going to click uh, uh, on, uh, I'm going to make sure that I'm in the Phoenix region, which is where I have resources, etc. I'm going to go to the hamburger menu. Okay, and I'm going to click on Oracle database. All right. So when I click on Oracle database, you will see that I can actually choose autonomous database. Okay, and we have the very the different, uh, you know, uh, deployment options for for autonomous database, the different workload types for autonomous database. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to make sure I'm in the CDN compartment right now. I'm going to create an autonomous database. So create autonomous database, you'll see that there was one database there already, but this is what you get when you are creating an autonomous database. So you can change the display name. I can add my name there in the last part. You will see that you can choose a workload type. And what is the workload type? The underlying technology is the same. So it is an autonomous database, but you can have it configured for a specific type of work workload. If you want to host analytics data, like a data warehouse, uh, the database is optimized, the memory, et cetera, is optimized to uh, uh, use columnar, uh, columnar format, uh, optimized for, qu uh, for queries uh, rather than transaction processing, et cetera. Uh, you can choose transaction processing and you get, get it optimized for the typical database that is being hit with transactions you know, all the, all the time like maybe you're selling stuff or something like that. Uh, or, or you can actually choose JSON, uh, JSON type of workload if you want to store documents or Apex, which is a way to quickly develop uh, applications. And it's very specific. So the underlying database is not changing. What is changes is the configuration to make it op optimal for the specific type of workload, okay? So then it comes the uh, deployment type selection. As I mentioned, you have shared and you have dedicated, right? So if you want to quickly create one and we want to quickly create, create one right now, you will uh, uh, choose a shared, for example. And uh, so uh, if you want to this database to be always free, and even though you run out of credits uh, after you get this uh, really nice uh, uh, deal with uh, using this five, five, $500 with it, uh, tenancy, et cetera. Even if you want to keep databases always free, you can do that, okay? You can run an always free autonomous database. It obviously has limitations, but you can have uh, up to two autonomous database, databases that are always free forever, okay? So this is something I, I wanted to mention. Obviously, you are limited in the resources that you can assign to, okay? So we have the ability to choose the underlying Oracle database. So autonomous database, it is an Oracle database behind the curtains. So you can choose, for example, in this case, 19C, but as we have more versions, you will be able to choose different versions. And you can choose the compute and the storage. So those are the two parameters that at the very fundamental level define your autonomous database. The number of CPUs that you have in order to have power you know, and performance and the amount of storage that you have in order to actually store the, uh, uh, the data, right? So in this case, I'm going to go with one OCPU, which roughly translates to a physical core, to give you an idea, the OCPU, and one terabyte of storage. But I also have this, which is very interesting, which is uh, auto scaling. And I can basically choose that I want to uh, enable uh, OCPU auto scaling, which is the CPU auto scaling, and also the storage auto scaling. So the database is fully elastic in the sense that you can uh, make it scale uh, automatically when the database has been hit by a lot of, uh, let's say, a lot of requests. How does it work? Uh, in, in this case, uh, we have a policy for auto scaling where we can go, uh, you can go up to 3x of the uh, assigned amount of uh, CPU and storage. You can go up to 3x. If there's a peak, for example, if you're facing a, a, a peak, uh, you know, time where you have been hit uh, heavily on the database. Okay, so then I will go and create an, an, an admin password. Let me do that now. And of course, and I said, as I said, you can follow me. If you want to create your first autonomous database uh, uh, in your OCI account, you can go right now. You can choose Oracle database, autonomous database, and you can just follow and do the same thing. Okay. All right. So. Uh, now it comes the network access, and, and this means how secure I want this database to be. I have several options here. 
So as, as you can see, I can have like a private endpoint that I can only access from my VCN. And I can also allow a specific IPs, as you can see here, on I, or I can allow secure access from everywhere, meaning that if I have the right authentication credentials to actually access the database, I can connect to it no matter where I am. So that's what I'm going to choose right now, which by the way is the least uh, secure uh, option, right? Uh, as you can see, you know, because this is not very secure that any anybody can connect from anywhere, uh, we are uh, basically forcing you to use uh, mutual TLS, MTLS. So this will be a wallet-based authentication, okay? Okay, so we keep going and we are almost done here uh, in the end. Uh, so you can choose a license uh, for existing Oracle users. You can, you can choose bring your own license. So suppose that you have an Oracle Database Enterprise Edition license or you have an Oracle Database Standard Edition license, you are entitled to CPUs here and to storage here uh, uh, given the license that you already have. So you can use that option, right? But if you have nothing to do with Oracle, you never have a database or you don't have a database, etc., you can still use this. You can use license included and you basically pay as you go, right? The prices, if you have Oracle licenses, are slightly cheaper, or I would say not slightly, but they are cheaper, okay? So I'm going to go with license included. You can enter a, a contact email, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to just click on create right now, okay? Create autonomous database. And this is, uh, I have actually uh, measured this. This is provisioning right now. So this is going to take uh, two minutes, okay? To give you an idea. So as, uh, as we leave it provisioning, which is going to be around two minutes, I'm going to explain a couple of things, okay? So this is our Oracle database in the cloud. So right now I will be able to access this Oracle database with any tool that I typically use for accessing any Oracle uh, database. Like for example, SQL developer, anything that I use to basically do SQL over the database, I can actually go ahead and use the database connection details that will show up here uh, in a sec, when it, when it ends uh, provisioning, and you can connect to this. So it's a very quick and very easy way for you to actually spin up uh, a database, uh, a very powerful database, I, I'm, I must say, and you don't have to worry about all the admin because it's autonomous. There's a lot of things that are being done automatically for you. You don't have to basically come and tune an index, for example, if you had experience with relation databases. That's going to be done for you automatically, okay? Okay, so I'm seeing some of the results of the poll. Uh, you, uh, you will see, you get more details about uh, all of these uh, specific aspects, okay? All right, so uh, let me see what else I wanted to cover here. Uh, okay, so uh, autonomous data guards. You can enable autonomous data guard here. I'm not going to do that right now, but basically you can have a standby copy of this database automatically and you can fail over to it if there is a problem. So if you enable this with just one click and, and there you go, it's a it provision, right? Now, now the database is available. Uh, and we went with autonomous data, data warehouse, which is basically uh, the option to store uh, analytical data. Uh, all right, so uh, suppose I want to have, uh, if, if, I, if I run into an issue with this database, I want to have like a, a standby that I can quickly switch over to the standby. I, I can enable autonomous data guard with one click and I basically have that automatically, completely automatically. So I can uh, fail over to it uh, automatically if there's an issue. So suppose the system detects an issue and makes the failover for you, you don't have to come and click and you know anything, but you can also do manual failovers and say, okay, this is my primary, this is my secondary, and I can switch you know, back and forth. Okay, the good thing about uh, uh, when this uh, fails, uh, suppose that this fails and you go to the secondary database, that uh, that second data database becomes the primary, suddenly uh, this, the users do not perceive uh, uh, any, any issues, they continue working and the system quickly provisions another secondary database for you automatically so you have, so you're covered again. Okay, so this is really nice. All right, so um, as I mentioned before, this is a full blown database and I have uh, connection in information here. So I click on database connection, okay? Here I have the TS uh, name and connection strings that I, that I could use, as you can see here. 
but I, I can also download an instant wallet, okay? And uh, there are some requirements to use wallets, and, but you are uh, covered if you're using JDBC, Think Client, or relatively new version, if you're using Python for Oracle Driver, etc. So there's something I, I'm, I'm going to, to show you in a bit where uh, there are different options for you to connect to the database now, now that we have provisioned it, okay? All right, so um, I'm going to show you database actions, okay? Obviously here we have stop, restart, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can terminate it. Uh, and we have different tools that have been configured for you. So as you, as you can see here, if you click on tool configuration, you have URLs for you to access specific services like database actions, which is here I have a shortcut for it, okay? But I also have Graph Studio, Oracle Machine Learning. Oracle Machine Learning is super interesting because uh, we are running uh, more than 30 machine learning algorithms within the database itself. So we actually uh, took uh, existing machine learning algorithms and optimize them to run in the database. So you don't have to be moving data outside the database to actually do, do your machine learning, but you basically bring the algorithms to the database so you can do the machine learning. And I hope that this is, this could be one of the follow-up um, sessions where we can actually take a look at, at everything that you can do with Oracle Machine Learning. You also have data transforms, uh, and, and here you have the, the direct link to go to the specific functionality where you can design graphical data transformations, you know, to move data, et cetera, et cetera. You also have web access orts, and this is REST API support. And I'm going to show you a little bit of that, that now. MongoDB API and Soda drivers, which is, this is for accessing graph uh, kind of uh, uh, data, okay? All right, so let's go back. Like, let's go to database actions right now. I'm clicking there and, and you, you can see launch TV actions, okay? All right. So it's launching. All right, so database action is very interesting because it's a, you know, like a whole menu of things that you can do with the database. Now that we have this database, we don't have any data yet, but we have all these tools that we can use. Right? For development specifically, we can do SQL, data modeler, uh, REST uh, API, liquid base, and I hope we can cover that later in, in, in a session. JSON, JSON documents, collections, etc., charts. So full of different services. So what I wanted to show you uh, today is uh, how you can uh, go to the data studio, okay? So let's go to data studio here and you will see what data studio is in a sec. And as I said, we don't have any data in the, in the database, right? So let's try to load some data to data studio, okay? So what I want to do is load data. Um, what I'm going to use is I have a, a local file. I, I can go to a cloud store. For example, I could go to an S3 based uh, cloud store and basically grab uh, data from there. Uh, I could go to a different database and bring my data from another database if I want to just do a migration, for example. But I could use a local file. I have a CSV file with customers, you know, um, invented customers. Uh, and I'm going to uh, drop that here, okay? So I, I do next. Okay. It says drag and drop here to upload. And I have my file here, which is a very simple CSV, as I mentioned before. So let me see if I can locate it now. One sec, there you go. Customers.csv. It's processing. So it's offering me to create the table customers. And, but what happened here? So I want to take a closer look about what, what this is doing. So I click here and I go to settings. And as you can see, it basically detected the all the sort the columns in the CSV, uh, and uh, this is just a plain CSV, right, with the uh, column names and the different uh, and the data, and um, basically assign uh, a column, you know, a specific column for each of these elements, and also a data type for each of these elements. Of course, I I can come and tune and change this to numerical, etc. I'm going to just to leave it as it is. So it's basically telling me the format, UTF-8, etc., etc., etc. All right. So uh, I, 
we have some other things here like a preview. This is what the CSV looks like, okay? Uh, I can even see the SQL that is going to create this table. So it's giving me the SQL for me, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to close and I'm just going to run with it. So I click on start, okay? Do you wish to run the data load jobs? Yes, run. Okay, so it's running. Took a couple of seconds. All right, and I am done. So now I want to see that that table is there and, and that data is there. So what I'm, what is it that I'm going to do? What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to click on this, uh, going back to database actions, okay, overview. Let's go back to database actions. And I'm going to click on this SQL box here, okay? All right, some tutorials recommended me that I do not use the admin user to do this. You can actually create a, a different user and work with a different user. So there you go. I have the customers uh, table here uh, with all the different uh, elements or all the different columns. And if I do select, uh, sorry, select everything from customers, and I click play, you can see that we have the uh, the data here, okay? All right, but that's not all. I wanted to show you something else and I'm going to cover this in, uh, I have a few more slides after we, we are done with the demo, okay? So I wanted to cover um, the, um, sorry, one sec. I wanted to cover uh, how to enable REST and, and how, how to basically make an API uh, expose this as an, uh, this table as an API. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on uh, right click on customers, rest, enable, All right, and uh, the alias is going to be customers as you can see here, and I'm going to copy this URL. Okay, I'm going to copy this URL, and I'm going to click on enable. Uh, notice that I did not click on enable authentication. So I'm basically opening this up without any kind of authentication, which is not a good idea. So that URL that I copy, if I go here, you can click on it and I'm basically getting back uh, this as, as a service. So you can actually, uh, if you're using Postman, for example, you can actually tap into this and, and, and extract the information, okay? So, uh, one more thing that I wanted to, to show you is, uh, let me let me see here. Um, okay, so suppose that I want to insert something here and I want to do a post. So I go here to rest and I go to core, uh, core command, for example. Let's see this, and I'm basically getting the core command for this. And if I click here on post, for example, I can feel the different uh, data, like, uh, I don't know, an ID, and I'm going to go with none here because I, I don't wanna just feel, feel the same. But basically, as you can see, this is being filled in automatically in, in, in the box below, right? So it's basically creating the post for me, all right? So I, I call this GRSS, just as a customer ID. So I have a core command right now. And if I go here and I put this core command here, I click on enter and I basically inserted that element into the service. So this is uh, a REST uh, API that we are using and we call this auto REST. So it's basically automatically creating REST interfaces from, from tables. It, obviously, ORTS is much more powerful than this, but this is just uh, one example, okay? All right, so let me show you uh, a little bit of uh, dedicated, because I show you how to create a shared instance. I, I just wanted to cover a little bit of dedicated. And Violeta, how are we doing with, with time? Uh, we still have 12 minutes okay, until the okay. hour. But okay. in case you have uh, cool stuff to show, uh, we can overrun a bit 
uh, don't worry about it. So okay. we might overrun like five minutes. I think I'm going to go to the uh, stop the demo here uh, because you know de dedicated takes some time. But basically, you provision uh, the the hardware, you provision exadata infrastructure, then you provision the autonomous VM cluster, then you provision a container, which is that picture that I show you with all the different uh, the different architecture, and then you provision an autonomous database. So you you have to create everything from the very uh, base basis, right? The hardware, the autonomous VM, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I just assign resources to it as you, as you move forward. But then when you create the database, you uh, have an autonomous database. And you can do the same things that I just showed you with autonomous, right? So I'm going to uh, change the sharing and I'm going to switch back to, um, to the slides to quickly cover a few topics before we, before we're, we are done, okay? So let me go here share i'm going to play can you see my my screen that's this demo yes 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 okay, we perfect. do okay so i'm going to quickly cover a few other aspects because i want you to vote for the next sessions with uh by understanding what we're talking about okay so uh i wanted to mention that there's a plugin for vs code if you go right now to VS Code, you go to the extensions, not plugins. Uh, this is the, the right name for uh, VS Code is extensions. You type Oracle, you will find the, the Oracle developer tools, tools for VS Code. And you can install it, and then you have to configure the uh, OCI CLI. This is something that uh, we can uh, cover together, but basically what you need to do is create, you go to OCI, create an API key, an API key, and when you create an API key, that gives you two things, a configuration, uh, which is basically the text defining the configuration of how to connect to OCI, and a, and a private key. If you have those two things, you download those two things to your uh, local machine, and you put that in a .oc .oci uh, directory, and you can point VS Code or even the OCI CLI to actually connect to OCI. to OCI. So those are the two things that you need in a local machine to connect to, to, the, to OCI from different tools. The OCI CLI, the Oracle Developer Tools for VS Code, the Eclipse uh, plugin. What you need is to have a configuration for how to connect to OCI, which is a file that defines a lot of parameters and a private key uh, for you to connect. That way you don't need a password. You need to enter a password every time you try to connect. Okay, so uh, I mentioned that there are multiple ways to connect to autonomous. So these are multiple drivers that we have right now. As you can see here, the ones in, with white phone font are open source drivers, okay? As a developer, you have tons of options, as you can see. Uh, the, uh, the ones with red phones are, are Oracle provider drivers, and then you have the, the JDBC, JDBC thin driver, which is probably the, the, the most wide, widely used so far. And then you have uh, third-party open drivers, like the ones with uh, green fonts created by different in different languages, like Rust, Erlang, Go, etc. Uh, a lot of the languages are uh, running on top of ODPIC, which is a, a, a wrapper uh, between the Oracle call, call interface and these other drivers. So the Oracle call, call interface is a bit complex. It's a kind of dif difficult to digest. So a lot of developers are uh, basically tapping into a middle layer, which is called odpi.c. But these are basically C libraries that expose the functionality to connect to the database. All right. So uh, let me just talk a bit about my microservices. And I show, showed you and I mentioned before that when you are dealing with multiple pluggable databases, microservices become easier because you can ad admin all of this, uh, you know, at, at the same time. So yeah, when you're dealing with multiple data types uh, in different uh, pluggable databases, notice that, for example, you could do analytics across all of them. Suppose that I, uh, I have microservices with uh, different databases, MongoDB, Snowflake, and, and different kind of databases. If I want to do analytics over all of them, that would be quite difficult, right? In this case, uh, since it's one single architecture, we can actually do uh, would be able to do analytics across all of them. But also noting, notice me, the message passing, which is something very important, TQ messages, okay? So there's a way for you to propagate events between microservices that is related to the database. And this is very, in my opinion, this is very powerful and it's something that I want to cover 
uh, in a bit of more more detail. Uh, think think of the Kafka brokers, for example, and you passing events uh, using Kafka brokers, right? So think of that and think what would happen if you had that closer to the data, right? All right. So uh, there's a library uh, called MicroTX that allows you, and we're still talking about microservices. One of the typical problems with microservices, what happens if I want to make sure that a transaction is atomic? I have multiple microservices. Suppose that one of these services is a, a hotel dealing with hotel reservations. There's another microservice dealing with flights. And I want to book both of them at the same time, but I want to make sure that both of them are booked at the same time. Not book the flight and not the hotel, not to the, the hotel and not the flight. How do I make this atomic? Across microservices, it's difficult because if I launch this request to book a flight, the flight is booked in a specific microservice, then I have to roll everything back. Maybe connect with the microservice again, say cancel this, but it has already been reserved, et cetera, et cetera. This is a typical problem with microservices. And we have a library called MicroTX Free which basically uh, serves as an orchestrator and, and as a manager of these types of uh, um, uh, scenarios. And you can uh, do uh, uh, a reservation-based kind of or orchestrations. You can do uh, try, confer confirm, cancel kind of uh, uh, scenarios where you first try if the um, if the uh, transaction would work, and then you can confirm or cancel depending on what the other services respond. Okay, so uh, this is a very interesting uh, thing to cover in future uh, in future sessions. What I'm co what I'm covering right now with all the slides is uh, things that I would like to cover in future sessions, and I want to know if you're interested. So make sure you vote accordingly. Okay. All right, let's let's keep going, and. Uh, I mentioned these events and event queues happening at the, at the data level. So one of the things that can happen, which is very bad, is you, uh, you make a modification in the database. Like for example, you, you insert something and you are working with a microservice, you need to surface an event that you have new data, right? Uh, the way this works is you have subscriptions for other, other services and every time something happens, the services that are interested would do something about it. But what happens if you insert data and you need to surface this event, maybe send it to a Kafka broker, for example, but then the broker breaks or the event is not surfaced correctly or something happens that makes the event uh, not happen, right? So you have a problem there because you have changed the data, but the event did not uh, properly propagate or was not properly properly generated. So there's this very widely known pattern in microservices called transactional outbox, outbox pattern, which uses a table, which is sitting next to the data table, but it's not the data table, it's a table with uh, a, a queue of events and it's called the outbox table. So if you have this table with the data that you need to modify and you have this table where you can actually insert an event there and say, there was an event, I inserted something uh, and, and you need to notify that event. If you have them both in a single database transaction, you are making sure that this is atomic, okay? So both happen or none happen. If I'm not able to insert that event in the outbox table, which is the table of events, the insert for the data is not going to happen. So this is good because you will not have inconsistencies. You either have the data and the event or you have nothing right and then you can decide with that table uh, where uh, how you send that uh, event to a message relay to a broker etc et so this is a typical uh, typically described uh, good practice pattern for microservices so we implemented this uh, specific pattern into what we call microservices with transactional event uh, queues or tx event queue for short okay so uh, you pro if you probably uh, you probably heard about AQs if you work with Oracle before. So advanced queues, you might have heard about it. Transactional event queues is the evolution of advanced queues. We are materializing this pattern that I just showed you, and what we're doing here is providing you a Kafka compatible architecture with topics and partitions in the database. Each database instance acts like a Kafka broker, to give you an idea. 
but improves on, on the functionalities. You can connect multiple databases together and have messages or events propagated across database, uh, database instances. And you can have your consumers connect to their nearest database instance. So uh, this can really scale up massively. There is also a Kafka connector that you, uh, so that you can join Kafka cl clusters, as you can see there in the graphic, into this event mesh. Uh, and uh, we have a Kafka API, a transaction event queue has a Kafka F F F uh, sorry, API, and Kafka-like REST APIs. So you can use Kafka clients directly against this. Suppose that you created a code that sends something to Kafka, to a Kafka broker, you can very easily replace that code and, and basically put this uh, as a replacement. So with all the event, you might be wondering, uh, why do I want this? Why, why not Kafka? Why do I should be using transaction events queues? Uh, with all this event handling being inside the database, you bring event streaming closer to the data. And this brings you speed. This is very, very, very fast because you don't have to go to a different uh, broker, to a different service. You're dealing with the same, you're in the same place. You make the combination of data and related events more consistent, as I told you before. It's all or nothing. You don't get any inconsistencies. And you also bring high availability guarantees that are part of the database to your message brokers. So your message bro broker, if, if maybe if it's Casca and you are not uh, having great high availability, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say uh, con conditions or, uh, or or service level agreements, etc. If your database is high availability and it's having this snapshots standby, this is standby data guard that I mentioned before. So basically, you have a high availability scenario. When you have the broker here, you also have the same high availability scenario. So your broker is basically like a terminator. You know, it's very difficult to to get that broken down. So it's a win-win-win situation. Same as before, we could cover this in a future session, and I think it's super, super interesting. Um, I'm going to skip this one for the sake of time. Now, I'm going to talk. Uh, I want to talk about DevOps, which is another very interesting topic uh, for developers specifically. We have comp uh, comprehensive APIs to inter inter instrumentalize database operation. We have detailed metrics and events for observability. We have a containerization support, which is something that I'm very interested in. And so we believe Autonomous Database is truly prepared for DevOps. But let's take a closer look. This was just a generic intro. We have Terraform orchestration, OK? Uh, we, we have a Terraform uh, provided for OCI, where you can Terraform anything that is in OCI, OK? And this supports Terraform Cloud and the OCI Resource Manager. We also have Ansible infrastructure as code. I'm not sure if you heard about Ansible uh, before, but basically handle inventories and playbooks uh, where you can actually uh, provision infrastructure as code. Uh, and this works with autonomous database, of course. You know? uh, then you, you ha we have support for Jenkins. We have an OCI Jenkins compute and an OCI DevOps uh, uh, plugins. So uh, OCI is ready to be working with, with Jenkins. And this obviously includes autonomous database because, because it is another OCI service. Not sure if you have our Liquibase, but we have Liquibase automation. Liquibase allows you to do ch uh, change tracking of database schemas. So every time you're changing a schema, you don't want to basically break your head with all the consequences and all of that. You can track different versions of your schemas and apply them by using uh, a Liquibase, which we have it running in our SQL CL. Uh, offering. We, SQL CL basically allows you to run SQL. It's like, a, let's say, if you are a Microsoft user, it's like a PowerShell for SQL, to give you an idea. And you have, uh, we have embedded Liquibase there. And this is, an, that would be another very interesting session to do together. We have Grafana visualizations. We have uh, three types of plugins, which I will cover in, in, in a sec, but also have reference architectures for you to uh, plug into Grafana dashboards from containers, and obviously dealing with autonomous database. And we also have uh, Prometheus uh, monitoring. So this is just an overview, but let's uh, take a closer look at some of the specific. So uh, for those of you that already heard about Liquibase, uh, we have Liquibase in SQL CL, as I mentioned uh, before. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, 
possibly a future se session that we can do together to actually see how we can ch uh, do change tracking and how we can make sure that uh, we uh, work with different versions, different schemas uh, without making a big, big mess. Okay. All right. So, uh, I'm, and I'm quickly going through multiple topics here because I want you to have an understanding of what we can cover in our, in our future sessions. And I want you to, want you to vote in the end, you know, depending on what you're interested in. So orgs, we saw a little bit of this already. And when I expose that customer's database as, uh, as the rest web services, web, web service, sorry, I was using orgs, but orgs is more powerful than that. What you saw is just a very small taste of what auto rest can do but you can uh, have page uh, page json response responses here you can uh, work with uh, any type of database cloud uh, cloud or on um, on premises uh, you can quickly create restful web services uh, and this is very devops friendly because you can not only automate uh, and instrumentalize the database itself or the database management itself but also your data thanks to ORs, okay? If you need to expose data in your, your uh, DevOps uh, processes. All right, so make sure you vote for this session if you're in, interested. Uh, containers, okay? Containers, and this is the, uh, I, I go through containers and then observability and that's it, okay? And we are done. So we are almost there. So what we have this uh, that we call Aura Operator. So uh, if you're doing DevOps and you're for sure working with containers, right? And uh, we have a really nice one for data, which is called Aura Operator. So as part of Oracle's, uh, let's say, idea to make Aura, the Oracle database uh, Kubernetes native, that's what we really want. And what we mean is with Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes data is that the data should be observable and operable through Kubernetes we created this Oracle database operator for Kubernetes. Uh, so the Oracle operator or the Aura operator for short, how, how we call it, extends the Kubernetes API with custom resources and controllers for automating Oracle database, uh, the lifecycle of Oracle database, and including all ADB cloud deployments. So autonomous database can also be operated, if you want, from uh, an, Kubernetes uh, container that you can spin up really quickly. This is in GitHub. This is open source. This is something that we can uh, we can cover. They are going to add observability uh, soon to this operator, which is uh, really nice. And we could have like a full blown demo, seeing how to uh, do everything that we want to do with the database from containers, from Kubernetes containers. All right. Last topic: observability. If you're a developer, you probably heard of observability all over the place. You probably heard about Grafana already. So there are three pillars of observability, and that's why I'm showing this. So we basically talk about metrics. We talk about logging when we say observability. We talk about tracing. And some uh, people, like uh, I think it was a Twitter, uh, yeah, it was a Twitter engineering that basically started the whole observability uh, hype. Uh, they also cover uh, alarms uh, and, um, and alerting, all right? So this is what we are talking about when you say observability. The database is obviously something that we need to observe. We need metrics for the database. We need logging. We need tracing if something is going on. And we also need alarms, events, etc. triggers, trigger, something going, going, goes on with the database. If the database goes down, we really need this, okay? So we have several options. Uh, and we have three Grafana plugins that you can go use right now. Uh, the first, uh, we, we, as I said before, we are always working with this, but uh, the first Grafana plugin uh, basically works at the database level, which is the one that you can see in the first column. You can go to Grafana Cloud right now, and you can actually provision this plugin and connect it to an autonomous database using a TCP connection. Uh, this plugin, uses SQL to extract metrics from the data. If you use Oracle before, you know that we have metrics within the data, the database that you can query via SQL. So basically this is what it's doing. It's using SQL to extract these uh, uh, metrics and show them in a Grafana dashboard. Okay, but we also have two other types of plugins that, co type, uh, that connect explicitly 
uh, was specifically to the OCI services that are uh, running metrics and logs. So the database is producing metrics and it's producing logs, but there are multiple of other services at OCI that are producing metrics and logs. So we have a specific services that deal with that. In OCI, it's called the, the monitoring service and, and uh, when it comes to metrics and the logging service when it comes to, to logs. So we have plugins that can connect Grafana, Grafana dashboards specifically to those services. So you can see metrics uh, of the database, but you can see metrics of any service that's running within OCI. Okay, same for logs. All right, the last uh, slide that I have here now is, uh, okay, suppose you want to do unify uh, observability, but you want to do it in, in a more DevOps friendly way, and you will want to do it from a container, okay? We have a reference implementation that we call, we call Prometheus Grafana for Oracle, where we connect a Kubernetes uh, container to an autonomous database, or it can be any, any database in, in any cloud database, we connect it uh, from a Kubernetes container and we create exporters, exporters in that Kubernetes container. We have a tracing exporter, metrics ex exporters, and logs of exporters. And we connect those exporters to Grafana, okay? This is an implementation that is open source and it's available for you right now to try out, all right? So I'm going to close with this uh, slide. Uh, I would like you to get started. If you are interested in any of these uh, uh, topics, I would like you to just go and try that out. Feel free to contact me if you want uh, links for this uh, last last slide that I mentioned and that I showed you, showed you because I have links for every single project that you can go and check out. Uh, remember to create your always free autonomous uh, database. Remember to use the credit that Violeta mentioned. And please, uh, now Violeta, let's open up the boat uh, for my next, my next session. I'm going to do a next cloud coaching and I would like you to decide which is the session that comes next, okay? So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Herman. I would like to thank you all for attending the call. Thank you, Herman, for being here and uh, presenting to us. Thank you. Of course, we are waiting you on, on upcoming events. Absolutely. Thank you and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.